Um, all right. So let's start with why do we need motion management? I think it's always a good uh, idea to start with the problem. Um, well, in this image, which I think you've seen in a previous lecture, um, you can see uh, CTs or cone beam CTs taken every fraction. And you can see that the different organs at risk and the prostate, which is uh, the target in this specific case, um, are moving day to day despite uh, patient setup um, and being set up with like tattoos and um, as closely to the planning day as possible. And that is just because of positioning errors, but also uh, internal motion. So for that reason, it's very important for us to be able to manage that motion to get the best result possible during radiotherapy treatments. Um, now, the previous uh, slide showed an example of motion from fraction to fraction. So that's called interfraction motion. But motion also occurs um, during treatment, so intrafraction. Um, and this is an example of a lung tumor that is just moving as the patient is breathing. So as you can imagine, um, it's important to address that, otherwise um, the tumor risks being underdosed, um, which would affect the treatment quality. And you can see that here um, with this prostate plan. So on the left, you have the plan with the dose as uh, calculated during the planning phase of the treatment. Um, on the right, you have the dose that would be delivered if there was no um, motion management. So if we just delivered the treatment as it was planned. And then in the middle, you can see that the dose, um, the actual dose delivered, if you do uh, some motion management will actually be more closely um, equal to the planned dose as opposed to what would happen if you didn't have motion management. Um, so now that we know that we need to manage motion, how do we actually do it? Um, well, this is the best way to do it is to think of it in three phases. Um, first, you need to have accurate delivery. It doesn't make sense to manage motion if you can't hit a static target to start with, um, obviously. Um, and how we do that has mostly been covered by Jonathan during the previous lecture, but I'll just give a very brief recap. Um, and then the, once you've got a very accurate delivery, um, the next step is positioning the patient in a repeatable manner. Um, but there's limitation to positioning. Like I mentioned, there is internal motions from day to day, and this is uncontrollable. And so um, to make, to give even more precision to our treatments, you then need to do target tracking or um, basically monitoring the target throughout the treatment um, and not just at the beginning, which is what positioning really is. Um, so looking into how we deliver accurate treatment, um, obviously there is a lot of quality assurance and testing that goes on in um, clinical sites to make sure that all components of the linear accelerator works as, uh, as we would want. But what I wanted to focus in is the evolution that's happened um, in the last 20 years or so in radiotherapy, which is the change from 3D conformal. So this is when you use the, um, the multi-leaf collimators to shape the beam to the target. Um, this allows you to do something more precise than just square fields, which is how um, it was before um, the introduction of the MLCs. Um, and then from 3D conformal, we moved on to intensity modulated radiotherapy, which is a treatment technique where you utilize the MLC to um, shape the fluence of the beam so that the dose can be more, um, more 
precisely shaped around the tumor. So you can see an example of that on the right. Um, one thing to note with IMRT is that um, you have static Gentry angles. And so you get these uh, higher entrance does compared to the next techniques, which is what is mostly used these days um, in Australia. And that is VMAT or ARC therapy, which is um, also an intensity modulated technique. However, the gantry is rotating around the patient. And so you can get, uh, you get these very typical uh, dose wash of VMAT. So basically low dose region all over the tumor, but the high dose region is very conformal, very uh, precisely shaped around the tumor. Um, and just to quickly show how precisely you can control um, intensity or beam intensity with uh, the mold sleeve collimator. Here on the leaf, you can uh, on the left, you can see the MLC moving and the real dose, uh, the dose in real time at the bottom and then the accumulation of the total dose. So that really allows you for, this is a head and neck treatment. So it really allows you to spare the, um, the spinal cord, which is right here. Um, and so this is why um, intensity modulated treatments such as IMRT and VMAT are so good. Um, and there's a funny thing at the, um, this is a picture of Einstein except it's not really a picture because it's been captured on a X-ray film, which has been exposed using IMRT. And so you were, they were able to precisely shape the intensity on each pixel so that you get a photo that you would recognize as a person uh, named Einstein. So that's actually something I thought was a funny fact about intensity modulation. It is extremely accurate. Um, all right, so now that we have finished with um, accurately delivering the treatment, if you don't know where your target is, you won't, it doesn't matter how accurate you are. And this is where the next two sections really come from. Positioning um, is basically this, um, the science of putting the patient back in the exact same position every treatment fraction. So there's several ways to do that. Um, the one that the ones that are used most commonly are in image guided radiotherapy and then also immobilization. So image guided radiotherapy is something that's now pretty much available on all standard Linux. And um, they all come with a um, an X-ray beam and a X-ray detector. So in orange is the X-ray source, in blue is the X-ray detector, and that can go around the patient and take images such as these, um, which have been taken uh, using the onboard imagers, which is what those two components are called. Um, so together, um, these two allows you to take uh, cone beam CTs um, as the gantry rotates around the patient. They can capture images from all directions. And then you end up with something like this. Um, so on the top left here, you have a cone beam CT uh, acquired on a linear accelerator. On the right, you have the, um, the CT, which is acquired um, basically on the day of the planning CT. And then um, you can superpose both of them on the same image. And that allows you to, for example, look at the bony anatomy and make sure that, um, that they match um, so that the patient position currently as they are on the couch, which you just captured using the cone beam CT matches, the plan position, which is shown in the a CT. And so you end up with uh, modified fields like this where um, RTs can look at the match between the bony uh, edges and so on. 
So some of the pros of image guided radiotherapy or IGRT is that it's widely available. So all Linux are kept are, are capable of capturing radiographs and cone beam CTs. Um, it can be used to image the internal anatomy, which uh, is something that immobilization only cannot do. And so it doesn't require any special equipment. Um, and I'll put an asterisk there saying that it doesn't require any specialized equipment for a most use case. And when you want to do more advanced image guided uh, techniques, then you may need specialized equipment. Um, some of the cons is that it delivers ad additional radio uh, radiation dose. So those cone beam CTs and x-rays are additional dose to the patient. Um, so that limits how much imaging you can do uh, before the radiation becomes harmful to the patient. Um, cone beam CTs on the LINAC takes about a minute and a half. So it's not really something that you can do um, for intrafraction motion. For example, you can imagine that breathing, you'll have um, multiple breathing cycle every minute and a half. And so a cone beam CT wouldn't be really useful to uh, detect the motion from breathing. Um, but also you cannot take a cone beam CT at the same time as you're delivering uh, the treatment. And so it doesn't really make sense to pause the treatment for and take a cone beam CT uh, frequently. You would only do that if you absolutely needed to, or you think that the patient has moved uh, significantly from their uh, from the, their position when the treatment started. Um, so like I mentioned, unlike immobilization, it doesn't stop motion. And so you're able to detect the motion, but if the patients move, then um, that's pointless. So often, um, image guided radiotherapy will be used with some form of immobilization. Um, and again, I'll put a asterisk on the last points here. Uh, it cannot be used to adjust treatment delivery unless you use some more advanced techniques, uh, which are not readily available on all modern Linux. So this is just some example of immobilization. Um, on the left, you have thermoplastic masks. Um, this person here is wearing pretty much full body um, thermoplastic mask. This is not usually used. Uh, it would be localized to the site. So either the pelvis or the shoulder or head. Um, however, regardless of where, which site um, you use thermo the thermoplastic mask for, it's extremely um, uncomfortable for patients. Um, the process of molding these masks, um, basically the plastic is heated up so it becomes flexible, but it doesn't become super flexible. And then uh, basically the masks are pressured on the patient's body. So there's a huge amount of pressure if, for example, you're molding the face. Um, so you can imagine it being very uh, claustrophobic and uncomfortable. So that's a big con of uh, immobilization, or at least the thermoplastic mask part of the immobilization. Um, on the right, you have a uh, immobilization device for stereotactic treatments um, or stereotactic brain treatments. And in these, um, screws are surgically implanted on the patient's skull and then um, attached to the device on the couch uh, during treatment to really stop the patient from moving. And that's because some brain lesions, you need uh, precisions below a millimeter. Um, again, you, may, you can imagine that this is pretty invasive. And then um, in the image on the left, you also have some uh, less invasive form of immobilization, like those vacuum bags, which are molded to the shape of the body. And same thing with the headrests. Um, and so these are fairly comfortable for patients and are pretty much used 
for every patient or some form of those device or is used for every patient um, to stop them from moving inadvertently uh, just by accident. Um, so I think that's all for uh, immobilization. One thing I will say is that immobilization is great to stop the patient from moving uh, in terms of external motion. However, it doesn't do anything for internal motion. The patient is still breathing, they're still swallowing, they may still have some jitters. Um, and sometimes the fit of the immobilization changes. For example, if the patient loses weight or gains weight during treatment, um, the immobilization devices may not fit as well. And so there can be some motion uh, created because of that. And because you have the immobilization device right on top of the patient, um, this motion can often be hidden. Um, so for that reason, immobilization is not the preferred method, but in sometimes, it, sometimes it's just uh, necessary. So now moving on to target tracking. Um, I, so I have this very nice slide that shows kind of the evolution of image-guided radiotherapy. Um, so prior to um, when we had cone be uh, when we had the ability to get cone beam CT on Linux, there was just the pre-treatment CTs and then some sort of positioning based on markers or tattoos on the patient's skin or on the immobilization devices and the treatment would be delivered. And then we got the ability to use uh, cone beam CTs and radiograph during treatment delivery. And so we started taking images every treat every treatment fraction. And now we're starting to learn that um, intrafraction motion is very impactful on, um, on the quality of treatment. And so more and more, you'll find that there is some sort of intrafraction motion monitoring going on during the treatment instead of relying on the immobilization post positioning. Um, these are just some examples of systems uh, that use intrafraction image guided radiotherapy. These are systems that are commercially available. Um, so the exact tract uses um, x-rays and x-ray detectors that are hanging in the room. So it, it's additional to uh, what comes on the standard LINAC. So remember I mentioned that you can't really use IGRT during treatment. Um, one solution to this problem is to have um, additional x-rays and x-ray detectors in the room. And this is what the exact track does. Um, now, another solution is to not use x-rays. And so this is um, the vision RT system, which uses uh, optical cameras to detect surface of the, the surface of the patient. And that is then used to detect motion if uh, there is any. There are also some other systems. Uh, for example, some electromagnetic chips are, can be implanted in the tumor, which can then the position of those chips can then be detected. Um, and there's some commercial system for that. You can put radioisotopes and then detect the position of those radioisotopes. You can put surface markers, um, for example, the RPM system by Varian, which puts a block, uh, a marker block on the patient's abdomen so that you can track the patient breathing. Um, and I'm sure there are other systems that I'm missing. I know. I saw a paper recently about uh, a pressure-based system to detect patient motion. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there's lots of others that I haven't heard of. So um, why do we need intrafraction imaging? Well, these are uh, long tumor traces. And so you can see that the motion is very different uh, in each direction. Um, it has variable frequency. 
So the frequency change over the time of the treatment, the baseline, so the, the middle point changes over time, the range of motion, so the amplitude of these, way, uh, of these wave patterns are changing as well. Um, basically, everything changes over time. And you might think, well, let's just thoroughly analyze uh, a patient's breathing, and then we can assume that the next fraction they will breathe similarly. So even though it moves, maybe it moves in a repeatable manner. <clears throat> well, this has been proven uh, not true. So you can see here, um, there are, uh, again, breathing traces. And so you can see that um, each row is a different day. And you can see that day to day, the motion varies drastically. Um, there have been some, um, some studies that are looking at a uh, helping patient breathe in a reproducible manner. So for example, here at ImageX, we have the aviator trial, uh, which is looking at using biofeedback to help coach patient breathe uh, in, the, in a repeatable manner to avoid having to do um, real-time tumor tracking and being able to rely on uh, prior motion acquired during the 4D CT at, um, at treatment. And you may be wondering how impactful um, the change in breathing pattern is. Um, well, this is an example for a 25 grain one fraction uh, lung treatment. And so you can see that over the course of the treatment, the tumor position has shifted uh, by 18 millimeters. So that is sufficient that a part of the tumor would be severely underdosed, um, which would lead to basically either a failure of the treatment or a high chance, chance of uh, tumor recurrence. And you may have noticed that I've talked about lung tumors a lot, but lung tumors are not the only type of tumors that are moving. Um, so these are prostate uh, traces. So the, how it shows how um, prostate moves over the course of a treatment. And so you can see that there are shifts of several millimeters um, in both translation and uh, rotation. And so lung is really, is really not the only tumors that is problematic when it comes to motion. Um, prostate also is, which this motion is not at all um, caused by breathing. Um, there are also other sites, you can imagine any sites where uh, that is affected by the lung. So the liver, which is situated right under the lungs, uh, is also a site where there's a lot of motion. The pancreas is, has also a lot of motion. The esophagus has a lot of motion. Um, anything in the mouth um, can have quite a bit of motion during swallowing. And so there are really tumor sites all over the body that require intrafraction monitoring or intrafraction uh, motion management. So I, again, this is um, going back to the figure I showed at the beginning. Um, this is a prostate trace and then for that specific trace, you can, uh, you can see the plan. So it was a nice full coverage of the target without any sort of motion management. There's big hole and dose in the middle, which would lead to um, poor health outcomes. And then when you add motion management, then you, have, you go back to the original plan, uh, which is optimal in terms of um, helping the patient. So another reason why, uh, one way that you can do uh, motion management without intrafraction uh, monitoring 
is to base yourself on the 4D CT. So the 4D CT shows the position of the tumor at each phase of the breathing cycle. And so you can basically irradiate the entire area where the tumor is moving. And that's called uh, ITV approach um, or the integral, integral treatment volume. However, this leads to the, irradi the irradiation of a much larger volume. So in this figure on the right, this is the, tumor, the volume of lung tissue that needs to be irradiated for treating the tumor if you have real-time guidance versus the amount of tissue that needs to be irradiated if you use the ITV approach. So you can see it is a big difference. And at, in addition to that, um, the 4D CT does not capture the entire motion. Um, it's becoming more and more clear that the motion that is seen on the 4D CT is not fully representative of the motion that is actually happening inside the patient um, during treatment. And so this figure really shows that you're missing a large part of the motion. Some parts you're missing up to five millimeter, even more of, uh, uh, of motion. And so again, if you're missing the tumor, then you're not um, you're delivering dose to healthy tissues, um, which increase the risk of complication and lowers the risk, uh, the chance that you will cure the person. Um, and another way of doing, um, of dealing with motion uh, during treatment is to use beam gating. And so, Beam gating is really, the idea behind it is to treat the, uh, the tumor only when it is in a specific position. Um, you can do that without um, imaging. So you could do that, for example, just by, look, uh, by capturing the patient breathing trace. So you don't need to visualize the tumor um, in order to do beam gating. However, that also has its own issues. Um, so there, yeah, there's two ways to do beam gating. Either you do it based on the tumor position or you do it based on a surrogate, like for example, uh, the breathing signal. Um, the main issue with beam gating um, is that it is very slow. Um, so you can imagine that if I'm treating only if I'm treating the patient when, uh, only when they're in uh, two phases of the breathing cycle, so for example here, uh, say 80 plus or minus 5 and 20 plus or minus 5, then I'm only treating the patient 20% of the time, which means the treatment time is now suddenly five times longer. Um, and so getting treatments take a lot longer than regular treatment. Um, and given that our uh, cancer centers are very busy in usual time, um, that means less patient can be treated, which is also an issue. Um, so for that reason, beam gating is really only used these days uh, for the patients that will benefit the most. Um, those who have an observable motion that is very, uh, very large, um, or that type of thing. Um, another uh, way to do beam gating is um, deep inspiration breath hold. So this is specifically a treatment for breast cancer, uh, but breath holds can be used also to treat lung cancer. Um, basically the idea is that you coach the patient to uh, inhale, uh, at a reproducible way and then hold the breath for as long as they can. This way, you don't have as many pauses as you would during conventional uh, beam gating, which uh, I talked about in the previous slide. Um, another advantage of deep inspiration breath hold for breast cancer uh, treatment in this case is that it increased the lung volume and so adds separation between the treated area and the heart, 
which is the main organ at risk um, during breast treatment. Um, so just another way of doing beam gating that mitigate um, some of the inconvenience. And it's by far probably the most, um, the most used beam gating technique um, in, the, in current practice. And then the next option, which solves the issue of um, lung treatment is beam tracking. And so in this case, instead of only treating the tumor when it is in a specific um, breathing phase, you treat it the entire time, but you move the beam with the tumor. So you, this absolutely requires uh, imaging of the tumor it's not feasible um, with only looking at the breathing signal, for example, um, or at least I haven't heard of a way to do that safely. Um, the cons for this is that this is very hard to do. Um, there's only a few spe specialized piece of equipment that allows you to do that. Um, and they are very expensive. Um, and then the other way, the, the other negative is that very few tumors can be um, treated this way because imaging is difficult. So right now on the upper right, you're seeing a, an image of a tumor, of a lung tumor moving. And we know that lung is very low density, whereas the um, lung tumors are the normal density of the body. So they're much higher density than the lung tissue that, is, that surrounds them. And so it's very apparent, apparent on, um, on radiographs. However, that's not so the case for tumors of soft tissue, for example, liver tumors, head and neck tumors, even prostate. Um, they're very hard to see on a 2D image. And acquiring a 3D image um, basically negates the point of short treatment um, because you would need to pause the treatment for a minute and a half just to take a clone beam CT. Um, so these are a few piece of equipment that allows you to do this beam tracking. Um, the first one to ever do it was the cyber knife. Um, and the newest one was the Mitsubishi Vero. Um, so the CyberKnife is a um, robotic system that can move pretty much in a full sphere around the patient. Um, whereas the Vero is really meant to, um, to account for motion in the superior inferior plane. So that means a uh, tumor motion that goes in the same axis as the head to foot axis. And that is because this part here is a gimbaled uh, gantry, which means it rotates outside and inside. And so it can follow, it, follow the tumor. Um, there are currently no clinical ways to do beam tracking uh, on a standard LINAC. However, it has been done in clinical trials. For example, MLC tracking, where you move the leaves as the tumor is moving um, to track it. So that's been done in a clinical trial. However, um, it isn't uh, commercially available. And the other way is to move the couch, um, which hasn't been used in a clinical trial, but it's currently being developed by several group, including here at ImageX. Um, and this is just um, a very quick video of how to, um, how the cyber knife works. However, it doesn't seem to be working. So I apologize for that. Uh, but basically you have the tumor moving up and down and the cyber knife moves. Um, so pros and cons of image-guided adaptive radiotherapy, um, which is what I've been talking about uh, in the last couple of slides. Um, 
is that you can visualize the target directly. So instead of using a surrogate, you seeing your target as you're treating it. It can be used to adjust for changing internal anatomy. So what that means is if the tumor is moving in a way that is unpredictable, you can still adjust for that. Um, you can also adjust the treatment at the same time as delivery. So um, I, I've mostly talked about how you can move the beam up and down as the tumor is moving up and down. But you can also adjust the treatment so that if the tumor goes in front of an organ at risk, you can, for example, stop treating at that time and then continue treating when it moves away in order to keep the dose to organs at risk low while making sure that the tumor is fully covered. Um, this is mostly not clinical. Um, it requires some um, real-time dose calculations, which are really difficult to do, um, but it's something that you can do once you have a good visual approach to, see, um, to seeing the target in real time. One of the problem with adaptive radiotherapy is that because you're constantly imaging the patient, um, you get a lot of additional dose. So you need to find a way to mitigate that um, by using low dose imaging techniques. Um, and this is, a, um, this is something that is currently being developed uh, in several um, research institutions. Um, again, you don't have a way to stop the motion, unlike chemobilization. So if the patient decides to get out of the couch or if they sneeze and have a huge motion, um, then this isn't stopped. Uh, whereas with immobilization, that would be stopped. And then it requires costly equipment and a lot of expertise. So now we're getting to the fun part of this talk which is the future of motion management. Um, and so this is really gonna be looking at um, some of the research that I find interesting in this area of uh, radiotherapy. So starting with um, a technology that has been developed here at the ImageX Institute is the kilovoltage interfraction monitoring. Um, and the MLC tracking, which I've previously mentioned. So KIM, uh, or kilovoltage interfraction monitoring, is a way to see the tumor on a 2D X-ray um, as the tumor is moving. This, if you can do that, then you can do real-time treatment adaptation on a standard LINAC all you would need is a software update and it would be available to any treatment center that has it, um, that has a standard LINAC. So for that reason, it's um, very interesting to, uh, it has a huge potential reach as opposed to those costly machines, which are only available at the centers with the most money. Um, so you can see here, that as the tumor is moving, which you can see the tumor by the marker surrogate, um, as the tumor is moving, the MLCs are moving um, and continuously tracking the tumor and delivering dose to the tumor. So this has been tested in clinical trials for lung cancer, prostate cancer, and liver cancer. Uh, the liver trial is still currently recruiting patients. So the final results are not there, but for lung and prostate, it has shown very good um, dose improvement. So for example, this is an example of a liver fraction. So you can see the plan for the patient, um, the dose delivered with kilovoltage interfraction monitoring, and the dose that would have been delivered if Kim wasn't there. And so you can see that there is a huge uh, dissymmetric uh, underdose here, as opposed to the Kim dose, which is more um, 
which looks more like what you would want to achieve, which is the planned dose. So you can definitely see that um, Kim is benefiting the patient in this case. Now, one of the limitations of Kim is that it doesn't, um, it, it requires the implantation of markers. So if I go back a few slides, you see those markers here, they have been surgically implanted inside the tumor. This adds a patient visit and a surgery for the patient. Um, so we're currently working on markerless KB tumor segmentation, which as I've shown in this long photo that you've now seen several times, it's pretty easy for a long, uh, a long lung image to see the tumor. It is a lot harder, for example, in this case, which is a head and neck tumor. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, I can't tell the difference between normal tissue and the tumor on this image. However, we have managed to uh, train a neural network that can, um, that can do that. So this is work that has been done here at the ImageX Institute. Um, and so markerless lung tumor tracking is um, being investigated in two clinical trials um, in Australia uh, in collaboration with the ImageX Institute. And then we're also developing the technology to be able to do that for liver, pancreas, prostate, head and neck, and a central nervous system tumor where we're looking at uh, detecting the spinal cord automatically. So moving on from Kim, another area that I find very exciting for uh, motion management is MRI Linux. Um, there's currently, as far as I know, only one commercial MRI Linux system. That is the Unity system. Um, and we also have the, um, the Australian MRI Linux, which is a research uh, base machine that is at Liverpool Hospital in Sydney. So we have quite a few staff members uh, that work on this project, including David Weddington, which who is going to uh, give one of the summer lecture on MRI. So the main advantage of MRI Linux is the visualization of soft, soft tissue contrast. Um, so you can really tell here where the tumor is compared to the normal tissue outside. You can see it's much darker. This is something that would be completely invisible to CT. Um, this allows you to use the MRL neck for real-time tracking of tumors that are invisible to, this, uh, to CT or X-ray images. And so um, that's the main appeal of MRL neck. Now, one thing that I will say is MRL neck currently have no, uh, or the commercially available MRL Linux don't have a mode that allows you to do real-time tracking. So you can view the, uh, the tumor and change the plan prior to, to treatment, but not during treatment. Um, but that's an area that is quickly developing and I wouldn't be surprised to see a commercial solution to this problem in the next few years. Um, and then the last technique that I'm going to talk about is cardiac radioablation, um, which has a few other names. Um, but the idea here, um, like, okay. the idea here is that if you have um, a rhythmic heart, um, some of those conditions are caused by um, unusual or unwanted uh, electrical signal sent to uh, the left ventricle. Um, so the one method of doing it is to do open heart surgery and then burning a certain area around um, where the nerves, the, uh, the nerves are in the ventricle. Um, and that basically reduce 
uh, electrical conductivity of the heart and makes it go back to normal. But obviously that requires open heart surgery. So if you could do that with radiation, which is just the patient comes in, gets their treatment and get, walks out the same day, there's no surgery, there's no risk of infection, um, it would be much better for patients. So the idea is to use radiation to create the scare, the scar, the scaring uh, uh, of the heart around the ventricle to go back to a normal heart rhythm. Um, and so here, um, the biggest challenge with cardiac radioablation uh, is imaging and then the fact that the targets are so small. Um, they're really only a few millimeter size and then you have heart structures that are extremely radiosensitive very close by. Uh, for example, the aortic artery, um, if you irradiate that by accident, you can create um, deadly complication. So you can see here the example of a planned um, treatment for ventricular tachycardia, um, which is um, the disease that required cardiac radioablation. What would happen if there was no tracking? Because um, the heart is beating during treatment, obviously. So there is motion and this needs to be compensated. Um, if you can do MLC tracking, predicting the heart motion using a cardiac signal that is acquired um, in real time, then you can go back to having a dose that is much more similar to what is planned than normally delivered. So in conclusion, um, radiotherapy techniques have become incredibly accurate. However, the full benefits of this level of accuracy can only be achieved with equally accurate imaging. And that is something that is being developed now um, at a very rapid pace. So I think in terms of motion management, most of the novel techniques is done on the imaging level, um, at least the ones that I'm aware of. All right, so that's it for my lecture. Um, now, if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, hi, Yusuf. Um, with the kilowatt voltage monitoring, uh, is that done on uh, MV beam treatments as well, or is it just carry beam? Uh, for Kim, so Kim, I think, is done also on MV beam. So it's uh, it's mainly uses the KV beam, but then it uses the MV beam as a verification. So it's always checking itself. Um, the problem with MV beam is that the images are much harder to see, like they're much poorer quality than KV images, hmm. and so there's often you, sections of the treatment arc where you cannot see the, the markers. Um, whereas you on KV, you have no problem seeing the markers. So the tracking or yeah, the tumor tracking is based on the KV and then verified by the MV. And if there's a di discrepancy, then the Kim stops the treatment. But, um, but yeah, so it does use the MV as well. What I mean is, if the treatment itself is using MV beams, how oh, do you yeah. do? How do you do Kim? So, um, all right, let me go back to the picture of the Linac. Okay, so the MV beam is coming from here. Okay, and you have the MV detector. Um, the patient would be on this couch. So the KV source is here and here. Okay. Separate source. So there's separate source. Um, you do get some uh, noise, like extra noise, if the MV beam is running and you're doing KV images, but that's something you can handle with uh, Kim. Okay, thank you. Um, one more question. With the MRI line, I know that some people in the group they are working on uh, reducing the distortions yeah. in the images. So, if is the di distortions still a problem in commercial? 
uh, so in commercial MRID next, they are using they are being used to treat treatments. Uh, they are being used to treat patients. Yes. Um, so the MR Linux, there's a lot of issues with it um, because obviously you have moving metal parts in a huge magnetic field um, and you have to shield the, um, the treatment beam or like the electrons would be affected by the magnetic field of the MRI if they were um, exposed to it. So that has to be shielded. So combining everything creates some um, less than optimal um, imaging parameter, let's say. Um, and so, yeah, you, you, you have like way worse image quality than a, like a diagnostic MRI image. Um, you also have a lower field strength in general. Um, so yeah, it is also, it's a problem on both the Australian MRI Linux and the, um, the Unity, which is the commercial system. Um, but yeah, people are working on addressing all of these issues. Okay, thank you.